Welcome to this week's episode of Case of the Week series brought to you by eDiscovery Assistant in partnership with ACEDS. My name is Kelly Twigger. I'm the CEO and founder at eDiscovery Assistant, uh, which is a platform that delivers eDiscovery knowledge on demand. Thanks so much for joining me today. Each week on our Case of the Week series, I choose a recent decision in eDiscovery and talk to you about the practical implications of that decision. This week's case covers an important and very hot topic in eDiscovery, ESI protocols. There's a lot of debate going on in our space about whether parties need a protocol, in large part because some attorneys are dragging the process out for months and insisting on provisions that they are not necessarily entitled to under the rules and the underlying intent of the protocol is lost. And parties are also entering into protocols as a sort of rote process without really considering the fundamentals of what they're doing by putting an enforceable order before the court. And we're going to see an example of that here today in our decision. Now, at eDiscovery Assistant and at our law firm, ESI Attorneys, we advocate for the use of ESI protocols with a strong caveat that you need to be informed about the sources of ESI and issues that need to be included in a protocol that are important for the complexity and value of your case. You need to understand that you are governed by the scope of discovery that allows for relevant proportional data that is not privileged, but that you also provide for the specifics of the types of data that you're looking at getting. In today's world with what we call emerging technologies, um, we see a proliferation of text messages, social media, femoral messaging data, uh, collaboration tools, all of which require planning in an ESI protocol for you to be able to get the data in a way that's going to be most useful for you to leverage it to be able to tell your story. We recently created an extensive guide on ESI protocols uh, at eDiscovery Assistant that you can download for free. And Deja will add that link to the comments if you're interested in taking a look at that. Um, we'll also be conducting a, a webinar on eDiscovery Day. That's December 7th this year to talk about the pros and cons of protocols. Uh, that webinar is going to be conducted in partnership with ACEDS and Xtero, who sponsors eDiscovery Day. So mark your calendars. We'll be sure to send out that information in our weekly newsletter. Uh, and if you don't receive the newsletter, you'll want to sign up on our blog to do that uh, so that you'll get that information. All right, with that background, Let's dive into this week's decision, which is a very short state court decision from the New York um, state courts. Our partner, Doug Austin at eDiscovery Today, um, has also written up a short article on this case, and Deja will include the link to that article in the comments as well, so you can see Doug's take. You'll also have a link to the full text of the decision included in either the post or the comments, uh, depending whether you're viewing us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, or X. This week's decision comes to us from Latin Markets Brazil LLC versus McArdle. Uh, this is a decision from July of 2023, uh, written by Justice Robert Reed of the New York uh, Superior Court, Supreme Court. Excuse me. The, and this is a very short decision. It's just a few paragraphs. It's basically a five-minute read, but it's important um, in this world of ESI protocols. So what's the background of the case we're talking about here? Well, the plaintiff here alleges that two employees left its employment and violated their restrictive covenants, including the non-disclosure of confidential information, non-solicitation of employees and clients, and a non-compete clause. The two employees left and formed their own competing company, and plaintiff brought this complaint alleging misappropriation of trade secrets, breach of contract, unfair competition, tortious interference, breach of fiduciary duty, and conversion. So basically every theory of liability that could possibly stick. But we are before the court here on a motion to compel the production of text messages, social media, and LinkedIn messages for the three month period before and after the employees, the former employees, uh, formed their competing company in July of 2020. Now, what the facts don't tell you at the outset of the case, but you see later, is that the plaintiffs don't ask for this information until a year after discovery has already kicked off. Now, 
As always, we start with the parameters of discovery that the information sought must be relevant, proportional, and non-privileged. And the plaintiffs make pretty good arguments here about the relevance and proportionality of the data they seek. Um, the plaintiffs allege that over the course of document discovery, the two em former employees' breaches of contract were demonstrated by documents showing their formation of a competing company while they were still employed by the plaintiff, that they downloaded confidential databases prior to resigning from the plaintiff, and that they transferred documents, those documents, to their personal email accounts. During document production, uh, one of the employee's emails with a client of the plaintiff allegedly indicated that communications were made over LinkedIn and text messages. And plaintiff argued that those communications um, that it now seeks on this motion to compel will, quote, likely reveal which clients uh, Mr. Mallon and Mr. McArdle contacted and attempted to solicit, as well as any other discussions of improperly removing and using markets groups, confidential materials, close quote. The plaintiffs also contended that the three month scope of its demand is limited in nature and does not constitute a fishing expedition. At the same time, plaintiffs agreed to forego any metadata or the collection of defendants electronic devices for forensic inspection and agreed to accept PDF screenshots of the responsive documents. So basically they just wanted the information. They weren't, uh, didn't wanna fight about what format it should be kept in or create an additional uh, higher expense, I would say, for the defendants to collect the information and produce it. Now, the plaintiffs did hear what I advocate for each week on the case of the week. They made specific factual arguments backed up by data that they had already received in discovery as a basis for why the additional information would be relevant and proportional. And they did it in a timely fashion that gave them sufficient ability to ask for additional discovery before the close of discovery. But that last point is one that the defendants took issue with. The defendants didn't oppose the relevance or proportionality of the discovery requests, but they did argue one, that they weren't timely because they happened a year later, and two, that the plaintiffs had agreed not to seek text messages in the ESI stipulation between the parties and that this demand is untimely. So essentially, we've got here an ESI stipulation between the parties that the court signed off on. We don't have access to that on the docket, unfortunately, to be able to find that exact information, but we do have what the court cites. So the court's analysis here is very brief. The court found that the defendants were correct and cited to the stipulation that the plaintiffs agreed to, which provided that, quote, the following sources of ESI information do not warrant collection, search, review, or production. A, voicemail, text messages, or personal phones, or tablets and instant messages, close quote. The court stated that the plaintiff made no showings of fraud, duress, coercion, or mistake, warranting the court overturning the stipulation and denied the motion to compel. Now, what is interesting to me here is that that language of the ESI stipulation does not cover social media, and yet the court seems to have denied the motion to compel in its entirety, even though the plaintiffs alleged that there were potentially relevant messages from LinkedIn. So there may be a subsequent motion here in order to go back and get those LinkedIn messages because they don't appear to be precluded by the language of that stipulation. Hopefully the plaintiff's counsel are on that. Our takeaways from this case are, are pretty important this week. Um, this, as I mentioned, is becoming one of our themes on case of the week. An ESI protocol is only as good as the thought that goes into it. There are two things that must happen for it to be effective and avoid the result here that we see in Latin markets. You must understand the scope of the sources of ESI that will be at issue and plan for how to handle them for review and to authenticate them at trial. You must also leave open the ability to expand the scope as further information is learned that means that additional sources may become discoverable. The biggest issue that I see with protocols that go sideways like the one here is that the parties are in a huge hurry to agree to a protocol at the beginning of the case without understanding all of the facts or where the responsive information might live. 
in this in this particular situation, in a situation with two employees who left and started a new business, and they were both clearly professional cl- colleagues who were plotting while still at the the plaintiff's employment. The idea that they would not have relevant text messages, in my opinion, is pretty cray cray. Uh, I don't understand that stipulation at all, agreeing to not uh, produce text messages at that early stage of discovery. And I'm guessing that nobody on the plaintiff's side realized what had happened until later. This is a state court decision, and it's following the exact same trend that we see in the federal courts. The courts will hold you to what you put in an ESI protocol or stipulation. Do not blindly sign a form or use the same form for every case. This is not a rote process. It requires complex thinking and the ability to think through the issues carefully. If you don't know the issues, learn them before you sign a document like this on your client's behalf or hire someone else who knows them. You can start uh, with our practical guide on ESI protocols. There's a ton of case law on this topic um, and you can filter for it using our ESI protocol issue tag in eDiscovery Assistant if you're a user. You can also use the new uh, AI generated summaries in eDiscovery Assistant to be able to skim through those cases and get to the ones that highlight the points you need. You can filter by ESI protocol and text messages. You can filter by ESI protocol and instant messaging or Teams and be able to drill directly into the language that you're looking for with sample protocols that you can leverage as long as they fit your case. Be thoughtful about this. It's a very important part of your case. This failure by plaintiffs may have significant ramifications for this case in terms of the evidence that's available to be presented. And really that's a lousy position for both the client and counsel. It's problematic. E-discovery is a minefield. Get up to speed on what you need to know when you need to know it and be sure that your ESI protocol reflects your knowledge of how communications might have occurred so that you can get information properly that allows you to tell your story. All right, that's our case of the week for this week. Thanks so much for joining me. We'll be back again with another decision from our eDiscovery Assistant database next week. As always, if you have a suggestion for a case to be covered, please drop me a line. Um, If you'd like to receive our newsletter delivered directly to your inbox with the case of the week included on Thursdays, uh, you can sign up at ediscoveryassistant.com backslash blog. And if you're interested in doing a free trial of our case law and resource database, please jump to ediscoveryassistant.com to sign up and get started. Thanks so much. Have a fantastic week. 